Vamos a pasar con la primera conferencia eh, que la va a impartir, va a dar Sven Lutiken. Y bueno, eh, comentaros un poco eh, ¿no? su, su trayectoria. Él estudió Historia del Arte en la Universidad Libre de Ámsterdam y también en la Universidad Libre de Freit Universidad de Berlín. Y en la actualidad trabaja como profesor en la Universidad eh, Libre de Ámsterdam. En 2004 recibió un premio de la crítica de arte del fondo BKVB de Ámsterdam. Eh, Sven escribe y publica ensayos de manera regular en, en diversas revistas en, internacionales, entre ellas eh, After All, New Left Review, Test for Kunt, Grey Room, perdón, y destacar algunos de sus libros, como por ejemplo Idols of the Market, eh, Modern Iconoclasm and the Fundamentalist Spectacle, que fue publicado por Spenberg Press en 2009, y History in Motion, Time in the Age of the Moving Image, también publicado por la misma editorial, Spenberg Press, en 2013. Eh, ahora está preparando un nuevo libro, eh, que se llama Cultural Revolution, Aesthetic Practice After Autonomy y será publicado próximamente también por Stenberg Press. Eh, por último, también destacar eh, que forma parte del comité editorial que se llama Open eh, Communist Aesthetics y que desempeña esta, esta actividad junto a Vina Choi eh, que es directora de Casco eh, Office for Art, Design and Theory, una pequeña institución muy interesante basada en, bueno, radicada en, en Utrecht, Holanda. Sorry, I didn't mean to start this. Okay. Ah. Okay, I'll just shut up, Willem. Go on. <laughs> El título de su conferencia es eh, Estudio Gestual. Y toma como punto de partida, bueno, nos va a explicar él, una colaboración entre el escritor y filósofo checo Wilhelm Flusser y el artista francés Fred Forrest que llevaron a cabo en 1974. Y con esto, I leave you the floor. Thank you, Lara. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to make some rather preliminary and open-ended. That'll help, thank you. I will make some rather uh, preliminary and open-ended remarks on the basis of um, a 1974 video lecture that Willem Flusser um, made in collaboration with the artist uh, Fred Forrest, which has recently been um, sort of uh, re-excavated by uh, Baruch uh, Gottlieb um, for an exhibition on Willem Flusser and the arts. And my remarks will be perhaps somewhat rudimentary, but in the context of you know this event uh, dedicated to the collective uh, study of images, uh, that can perhaps be quite uh, productive. And I'll, in a, in a sense, pick up on what Leira addressed, uh, you know, the relations, the various interrelations between images and words, also going into um, the relation between between uh, spoken and written words, um, sort of the triangle of spoken written words and the image, in particular the uh, post-cinematic uh, video image. So yeah, 1974, uh, Wilhelm Flusser is um, sitting and or standing um, more or less naked in a garden somewhere in, uh, in France, uh, wearing uh, shorts and his glasses, but nothing else. And he is uh, talking and gesturing about gestures. So Flusser uh, at that point, but actually up to his, uh, his, uh, his death in the early 1990s, was interested in uh, various ways of elaborating a philosophy of gestures that would no longer have to depend exclusively on written language. So gestures in particular seem to be uh, rather ill-suited for being addressed in uh, writing. So um, the lecture, uh, a conversation uh, about gestures, um, uh, a spoken discourse about gestures that could also uh, rely on the body, on the speaker's uh, physical uh, presence and movements, seem to be a good, good alternative, and um, a, a lecture or spoken discourse as remediated by video and by the gesture of video, as Flusser also called it, seemed to be even more 
um, promising. So I'll show a couple of uh, clips and uh, then take things from there. We start t at so two minutes into the video. Let me just go full screen. Yep. Like me, in the last few months, is a problem of the human gesture. And the more I thought about the problem, the more I became aware of the fact that traditional media like writing, linear writing, are not appropriate to transmit the phenomenon of the gesture. Because the gesture goes on in space-time continuum, whereas writing is a, is a linear codification which forces the phenomenon to become a linear process. I have been, on the other hand, very much impressed by the virtualities dormant in video because I have accompanied in the last time the, not only the experiments which Forrest makes but also the experiments made by other European and mostly American artists. So we have come together to make this tape in order to try and learn how to use this medium for the communication of a phenomenological vision of the human gesture. We have decided to do the tape in the following way. I shall propose to you, in spoken discourse, a specific theory of the gesture, and I shall try to illustrate my theory by gesturing. And while doing this, Forrest is going to fill me, which means he is going to do certain gestures which are at the same time a mirror of my own gestures and a critique of my gestures. Let me begin by proposing to you a definition of the term gesture. I would like to do that in order to distinguish gestures from other types of motions. Let me suggest that a gesture is a movement of the body which is not satisfactorily explained if I consider it to be the result of forces which play upon my body from outside. If I want to explain a gesture, I have to presume a kind of interiority within me which expresses itself through my gesture. Now the interiority which I am stipulating here <coughs> is not some mythical entity like a soul or a spirit. But you may conceive of it if you consider it to be a place where various sorts of forces interplay within me. The forces that are at work within me are of a very great range of orders. For instance, you may consider that within me physiological forces are at play and that the result of these physiological forces articulates itself, publishes itself through the gesture of my hand which you are now seeing. But you can equally well imagine those forces to be of a psychological order. It is the psychological tension within me that is articulated by this motion of my hand. 
or you can say that within me there are uh, sociological or or forces at play. I am a play ball of forces of society within I, which I find myself. And if you read the gesture of my hand as you see now, you can consider it to be the expression of the social forces which act upon me. The same may be said about cultural forces and so forth. Okay, so this video player is rather annoying because it can't be full screen and still give you um give you the minute count apparently uh, so i'll leave it on like uh, this for the time being so in other words gestures are overdetermined and um, there is no satisfactory causal explanation as flusser also puts it in his later 1991 book on gestures which is uh, one of the very last things that he uh, published um, there is also no uh, let's say direct there is no direct causal connection so it's not a gesture doesn't occur when you simply shrink back back from pain because you know you you put your hand in the fire or someone punches you it's not that sort of immediate uh, physiological uh, response a, a gesture has to do with a certain uh, process that occurs it has to do with a delay it is a more reasoned response there is an element of codification and so a gesture for flusser has to be codified if you sink, simply shrink back because of pain or because of some threat that's not a gesture if somehow your movement is culturally coded in some manner then it does become um, a gesture. So a gesture is never merely a symptom, right? Flusser uh, in his book in particular really stresses that uh, the gesture is a symbol, not a symptom. Okay, let's pick up things from here. This is really the most annoying media player ever, uh, but I'll um, turn the sound back on. Um, and Flusser here continues um, uh, articulating the dialectic, let's say, of the human being. Uh, so uh, being determined on the one hand, yet having subjective freedom. If you consider that, objectively speaking, my gesture is totally conditioned, even over-conditioned, and that, subjectively speaking, my gesture is completely free, you will perhaps agree with me if I say that the gesture is an articulation of the specific character of human being. It articulates, it expresses, it publishes what is usually called the dialectics of human being. Namely that man is totally conditioned by the world he finds himself in and subjectively that he is totally free within the world which he owns. Having thus defined gesture in order to distinguish it from other types of movements of the body, like for instance conditioned reflexes, let me now tell you that it is obvious that there are various kinds of gestures. I will distinguish for the purpose of this tape alone and only to provoke you, you who stand behind Forrest, you who in the future will stand behind him when you look at the tape which we are now making, I repeat, in order to suggest to you categories, types of gestures, I will propose four categories. I am not satisfied with my catalogue and I hope that you will be able to improve on the catalogue when discussing this tape. Now I will distinguish four types. One, I will say, is a gesture which hurts itself somehow against an obstacle. For instance, this gesture. Now, this is of course the gesture of writing. I didn't write it down because the, the fountain pen is not good enough and you would probably not see the letters on the tape. We are uh, fighting against material difficulties also. Now, this type of gesture which hurts itself against an obstacle is characterized by the fact that the gesture is changed by the obstacle and the obstacle is changed by the gesture. 
in writing, the motion of my hand is changed by the paper on which it writes, and the paper is of course changed by my writing. Now, what I just said is called dial. Okay, so he wasn't satisfied with his catalog at the time and actually he continued to uh, basically multiply types of gestures in his 1991 book. You know, there's the gesture of this, the gesture of that. It's quite a long list and it even, even can seem somewhat random uh, at a certain point. Um, there's an intriguing opposition, I would say, or an intriguing relation between his thoughts on the gesture of writing, huh, which you've seen here, and the gesture of speaking, which he um, addresses in the book in particular and uh, it's curious that he addresses the gesture of speaking or he analyzes the gesture of speaking in terms of you know not of gestures you know that speakers make while speaking uh, but in terms of actually the movements of the vocal cords the tongue and the lips and so so it's 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 a curiously um, it's a curiously uh, let's say understated um, type of gesture that he identifies the gesture of speaking with. It's not a speaker, uh, you know, being uh, all like this. Uh, it's actually about uh, movements that, you know, you can't even see, to uh, at least some of them, you know, the vocal cords, you don't normally see those. You don't even, you know, see the movement of the tongue that much. The lips are a different matter, but it's not what actually is commonly understood by gestures and gesturing. If you look up dictionary definitions, um, you know, it's defined in terms of mostly uh, the hands and, and the head. Um, so there is, you might say, a kind of desublimation at work here in that he actually focuses on organs that aren't uh, sort of usually considered um, in the context of gestures. There's almost a kind of battalion focus here on what is usually overlooked, uh, uh, the big toe, let's say. Later on, uh, we'll hear him actually discuss uh, feet and the movements of feet or the gestures of feet. So there is that. There is, there is a kind of um, a deconstruction of, of hierarchies here, hierarchies between organs. But it also results in a strange, almost sort of platonic uh, idea of the gesture. I mean, to what extent is he really ad uh, addressing the gesture of speaking? Is he basically just ad addressing the act of speaking as such? Is there a kind of conflation here between the gesture of speaking and the, the act of speaking in a you know, very basic uh, sense, almost indeed a kind of platonic idea of speaking as such? So he doesn't actually seem to... Um, let's say, uh, get down to the nitty-gritty of actually analyzing uh, specific uh, movements all that much. Also with writing, you know, the gesture of writing is identified with this very basic uh, motion of scratching a surface, hurling yourself against um, a surface. Oops. Um, let's see. Um, okay, and now I'm going to pick up the uh, video again with uh, a somewhat longer clip, the final clip that I'll play, and this one is, is 10 minutes or a bit over 10 minutes, in which he also really um, shifts from um, developing, you know, his rudimentary uh, categories pertaining to the study of gesture. He, he shifts from there to uh, addressing the medium of uh, video and its potential for education, for the dissemination, but also the production of new uh, knowledge in the post-Gutenbergian context, right? You really have to see this in terms of Flusser's uh, overall narrative about um, uh, pre-literary cultures, then uh, literary cultures uh, dominated by writing and then later by print, and then the shift to uh, a post-linguistic um, culture of coded services, techno codes um, dominated by, uh, by video and then by digital media. And that's very much sort of the, the narrative that's in the background. Okay, sound. Which characterizes this gesture. As a consequence, the gesture has the structure of my hand. It is what is called a manipulation. What is necessary in studying the gesture is to reveal this hand structure behind it. And what I said about the hand is true about all other gestures of my body. For instance, if you consider what I am telling you now, 
Well, of course, this is the result of a motion of my tongue. You cannot see my tongue because you read what I am saying to be a codified message, codified through the English language. But in fact, you know that behind the code there is the gesture of my tongue. Now, it is a fact that not all organs of the body are really utilized for expressing my interiority. Some of them are repressed by the social and cultural uh, establishment within which we find ourselves. I will not speak about the obvious tyranny of the establishment as far as my body and its ability to gesture is concerned. I will not speak about the fact that, of course, I cannot now gesture toward you with my sex. But I will uh, draw your attention to less overt forms of tyranny. For instance, our feet. Our feet are, of course, capable of a great range of gestures. We know that, not only theoretically, but I give you an example for it. I come from Brazil. And in Brazil there is a discipline in the town of Recife, which is called capoeira. In this discipline, people learn how to use their feet not only for dancing and fighting by standing on their hands and putting their feet up, but also by expressing through their feet their emotions and their thoughts. Whereas we Occidentals are always prisoners of shoes. Our culture imposes on our feet a sort of concentration camp namely shoes, which impoverishes our possibility to articulate our interiority through our body. And I can give, give you a number of other examples for this. Now this is more or less the area of my interest as far as gesture is concerned. I would like to study it. I'd like to go into it. I'd like to write a general theory of the human gesture. But as I told you, I found out that traditional media, like books or essays in learned uh, publications, that these traditional media are not suitable for my purpose. And I told you why. Because the structure of the media is in disagreement with the structure of the phenomenon which I want to capture. But now we have video. Video seems to be, at least if looked at it from outside, an ideal medium to transmit a theory of the human gesture. Because the video is in the same time con space continuum in which the concrete phenomenon of the gesture goes on and because it allows being audiovisual that the concrete phenomenon be commented linguistically while it happens look what you are now watching you are watching me gesturing and at the same time you are watching me proposing to you a theory of the gestures I am doing. But this is not all that is to it. I am not by myself in gesturing, nor am I in front of a passive public which is looking at me. I am looking at forest while he is filming me. Now what is Forrest doing? He is trying to gesture his camera in a way to accompany both my gestures and my thoughts. But this is more. 
he is so deeply involved in the process that while accompanying me he is also criticizing me which you have probably remarked earlier during this tape all his motions are in accord with mine on the other hand I am not totally free in gesturing I am trying to adapt myself both to forest and to the machinery which he is handling which means that Fred Forrest is not watching objectively my gestures and my theory of gestures, but he is involved in the object, in the phenomenon. There is an intersubjective uh, relationship between myself and Forrest. We are having a dialogue. Now the tape which you are, go which you are going to see is the result of the dialogue between myself and Forrest. Still, this is not all. The tape which you are seeing now is a sort of challenge to you to participate yourself in the dialogue about gestures and about videotapes which we, in which we, Forrest and myself, are engaged at present. You, in the future. And now I am pointing not to space but to time space-time continuum, you remember, you will stand in several months from now at the point to which I am now pointing. Now you are invited to participate in this dialogue. Now so here we are, not several months, but several decades um, into the future, uh, being pointed at by um, Flusser. And, um, you know, there are intriguing things going on here, obviously. Um, one, one is also this, this remark that, you know, behind the code, behind the linguistic code that he's using is the gesture of the tongue, but it's, but it's invisible. And so on the one hand, he seems to, uh, you know, indeed want to desublimate uh, the code, the linguistic code, by pointing towards the gesture of the tongue. On the, on the other hand, he's also, uh, let's say, uh, uh, turning gestures into uh, into a code. In the book in particular, the 1991 book, uh, gestures are very much about codification, about symbolic elaboration. And so there's, there's a strange kind of uh, circle going on here almost. Um, then there is indeed this, this narrative about the rise of techno codes and the role of video in the education of the future. And the gesture of writing for Flusser was about to become an archaic gesture. And there's, there's a great sad passage in the book in which he says, or he writes rather, we need to think in video, in analog and digital models in programs, in multi-dimensional codes. Writing is no longer either effective or valuable as an expression of a way of being. And yet, of course, Flusser himself counts, among him, counts himself among those archaic beings, that's his expression, the archaic beings for whom writing is necessary, living is not. So he, in a sense, is also writing about his own perceived obsolescence. And I don't necessarily, of course, agree with that diagnosis. I think Flusser, like McLuhan, was someone who was great at diagnosing the need for a diagnosis. He was, he was you know, he had a great antennae and he was, he was very um, uh, perceptive when it came to identifying phenomena that needed to be diagnosed. Uh, his actual diagnosis is a different matter or can be a different matter. So there is this whole narrative about uh, the end of history, uh, um, you know, which is uh, marked by the uh, transition from a Gutenbergian to a post-Gutenbergian culture uh, and uh, towards a society in which we face, and I quote uh, Flusser here, method for method's sake, technology as a goal in itself, and l'art pour l'art, that is function as the function of a function. That is the post-historical life without work. It is post-historical because history is a process in which people change the world so that it is as it should be. And when work, work stops, history too is still. And work stops when it no longer makes sense to ask how the world should be. 
It stops when the apparatus determines itself. So on the one hand, end of quotes, on the one hand there is this, you might say, emancipatory uh, narrative about the potential of, of, of video, uh, the potential about post-Gutenbergian medium uh, media. Um, on the other hand, there is the notion of, well, the apparatus will just determine itself in the uh, age of video, of digital techno codes. Um, in other words, uh, there will be no uh, sort of real human agency uh, historical agency to uh, speak of. Uh, and uh, um, Flusser very much then subscribes to a notion of history as control, history as sort of a de -pro uh, de progressive uh, implementation of human control over the world. And when that is lost, because basically the cybernetic apparatus is, is controlling everything, we have moved beyond history, beyond history as human agency, human control. Of course, there's also a different uh, understanding of history, which is that of history as conflict, right? And we're still very much in the middle of that history, history as the uh, sort of, let's say, dialectical unfolding of um, conflicts between humans, but also between humans and um, the apparatus or various machinic uh, entanglements or human um, human technological um, entanglements. So uh, um, in the sort of, let's say, framework of that unfolding uh, history, we also uh, find ourselves uh, faced with, um, let's say, a performative imperative. There are new forms of extraction, new forms of uh, performative extraction, um, and uh, writers uh, and artists are increasingly also uh, lecturers, uh, performers of um, Performers of lectures, they're supposed to, you know, give hybrid presentations that are called lecture uh, performances. And um, academics, for instance, are increasingly also um, encouraged, certainly certain, let's say, star academics, star speakers are encouraged to um, give online courses or take part in online MOOCs, uh, massive open online courses. Here, for instance, is uh, part of a, a MOOC uh, by... Uh, hate this video player. Uh, no, this is the wrong one. Also, this can only play one video at a time, apparently. I was uh, going to make a parallel montage and show various screens at one time, but that's impossible with this thing. Um, okay, this is, uh, this is part of an online MOOC uh, by Saskia Sassen, uh, the city as resilient entity. And so you get new uh, kinds of lectures, new forms of video um, performance. And I think uh, bringing uh, Flusser to the table and trying to develop, uh, but also critique um, uh, Flusser's conceptual apparatus could be um, uh, quite productive in that context. Whether or not we agree, we fully agree with Flusser's overarching narrative, it is clear that the public lecture with its uh, accompanying gestures has mutated under the, impact, under the impact of digital technology. So today's uh, today uh, talks in art institutions are routinely live streamed or posted on YouTube. I also have uh, this other um, uh, uh, Saskia uh, Sassen video here, uh, and if you could uh, show them at the same time, you could see uh, you know the difference really well. So here we have the video lecture, the MOOC, um, you know, with a whole setup in the studio with a with a green screen uh, background, etc., and Sassen directly addressing you as someone who is presumably paid for this course or who has certainly enrolled for this course at Leuphana University in Lüneburg um, in this particular case. So you're, you're really being addressed very directly in a almost one-on-one, -on -one, a sort of fictional one-on-one -on -one lecture. And then, of course, there's the uh, rather common uh, phenomena of uh, uh, lectures with audiences, lectures in front of audiences that are indeed either live streamed uh, or uh, posted online after the fact or uh, both. And of course those are two very different ways of remediating the lecture uh, through uh, video. In this case you do have the uh, element of let's say true liveness in front of an audience with uh, the possibility of interaction at least for the people who are there. Um, I always do want 
wonder um, how those uh, various uh, formats of uh, video lecture, video performance are being used. Uh, what is their, let's say, uh, medial uh, or intermedial agency? Uh, so from quite a few people, I'm hearing that often they uh, listen to lectures that have been posted online with the, uh, without really, you know, without really watching them. They have them playing in the background while they're, uh, you know, cooking the dishes or, uh, uh, sorry, cooking cooking dinner or doing the dishes. So uh, they become audio uh, files, basically. Just they also have a video component. And the question is, how relevant actually is that video component? And does it have the the critical dimension that Flusser recognized in the video component in the tape he uh, made with Fred Forrest? So um, can uh, the whole video dispositif actually also function as a kind of uh, gesture critique or as a kind of video gestural critique? What does it actually mean to have all those you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of um, lectures that are on YouTube and on other platforms? You know, some of them have only been watched by 10 people. Some of them have been watched by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. And of course, they're very professional, uh, very slick uh, formats. Of course, there's the very dominant and unbearable uh, TED Talk uh, uh, format. Um, and which is also very much about its its online uh, um, uh, life, let's say, its online afterlife. These are also you know, events that are designed to uh, function as, um, let's say, as video lectures. Um, then, of course, uh, there is um, um, the um, discourse um, about new forms of art criticism that would indeed take place within this space-time continuum that uh, uh, Flusser uh, addressed. So in uh, the theory of gestures for Flusser, there was obviously a huge uh, benefit in being able to uh, develop um, a theory of gestures orally uh, within, uh, the safe, uh, within the same uh, what is going on here, within the same space-time um, continuum. But actually, oh, this, this one doesn't work at all, or should I, if I clip, click accept her? Okay. Okay, so this one doesn't work. Okay, I had another clip that uh, showed, let's say, a live uh, critique of an exhibition in an art space in Amsterdam by a young critic who basically you know, takes you as the viewer on a tour through the exhibition and then critiques it as she uh, goes along. So, uh, you know, while also gesturing towards the works and gesturing about the works. Um, so indeed, within the same space-time continuum as the experience of um, encountering uh, and participating in the exhibition. So there's a whole set of uh, practices, and unfortunately, I, you know, I haven't been able to really show you uh, the constellation of these practices uh, on the same screen here. Um, but there's a whole constellation of practices that uh, certainly raise many questions um, uh, for me. Indeed, uh, how do they function? Is um, the video element, is the visual element, is the element of the moving image really used in uh, a critical manner? Is it being used to add something or indeed to detract something from the live performance? What is the role actually of the uh, embodied act of speaking? Is it indeed purely about the act of speaking and do we, you know, are the hand movements, for instance, simply uh, little uh, neurotic tics? Are they merely symptoms? Or even if they are symptoms, could they still be addressed? In a Flusserian context, clearly symptoms are not really part of a philosophy of gestures, because indeed gestures are symbolic, they are codified. However, there are some other, um, let's say, pointers in different bodies of theory that could perhaps be used. I'm thinking, for instance, of Rudolf von Laban's work on effort study. So in the 1940s, the dance pioneer Rudolf von Laban, whom you uh, all know because of the La famous Laban notation, I assume, Rudolf von Laban um, uh, developed a kind of alternative for the Gilbert style uh, motion study of, of, um, you know, of labor, of production processes. Um, and um, Laban tried to uh, 
develop a more holistic focus on individuals and on their potential as well as their uh, defects from a Fordist point of view. Um, so he sort of pioneered a human resource approach that perhaps points beyond the Gilbert's uh, focus on pure quantification. He also focused on mental workers, on office workers, not just on factory workers. And uh, he developed this really interesting notion of shadow moves, as he called them. So shadow moves are basically movements that are not really needed. So an office worker who you know fiddles around with something on his desk or who you know is wriggling around, they're not really needed for the work. They're kind of symptomatic um, articulation, articulations. And I quote um, uh, von Laban, when the office worker has become used to the burning up of nervous tissue without the bigger without the relief by bigger movements, his performance will be less disturbed by the, addition, by the addition of emotional shadow moves. It is the same with a child who has become used to sitting quietly at a desk. And so shadow moves are these unproductive movements that uh, basically just have to do with the burning up of nervous tissue, as he puts it. So you're supposed to sit still behind your desk, but you know that's basically inhuman. Um, and he, of course, worked on trying to to reduce those shadow moves, or at least to integrate them into the work process in such a way that they would not be uh, detrimental uh, to it. So it was a matter of preventing effort habits, as he called them, from getting out of hand. Now, something like that perhaps could be applied also to the contemporary um, culture of uh, life uh, performance, various uh, lecture formats, lecture performance uh, uh, formats. Um, to what extent uh, do we have, let's say, an active gestural component that, um, uh, cont uh, that uh, contributes actively to uh, the spoken discourse, huh? to the uh, linguistic uh, code in its spoken form that, of course, we're all supposed to focus on. Uh, and indeed, uh, many people, again, do focus uh, on that code by disregarding uh, the video component. But then, so why is there this proliferation of um, video uh, lectures, video lecture performances? And of course, there are some um, let's say, some practices that uh, uh, um, might be seen as attempts to uh, realize um, a kind of um, a kind of uh, Flusserian, um, uh, more active and critical use of the whole video dispositif, of the whole um, um, digital video dispositif, even though in many cases uh, the use, um, the choice for um, a video lecture format may also have been an economic incentive or may be due at least in part to an economic incentive. So Hito Steil, for instance, uh, has uh, remarked on the fact that she started to develop her lecture performances, which then ultimately also become video lecture performances, because she was constantly being invited for lectures by institutions who didn't want to fund new film works or new you know, video uh, pieces by her, but they did invite her for lectures. So they wanted the artist to be present and to speak about her work and perhaps to gesture towards her work on a screen, but they did not uh, allocate uh, any budget for producing uh, something new. So she, she basically turned the uh, lecturing about her work into the production of something new. So here you see uh, an extract from her uh, video is the museum a battlefield. So originally it was a lecture, a lecture performance, and then it has been sort of turned into, remediated uh, into um, a, a, a two-channel video piece in which, in this case, she's discussing um, obviously the famous sequence from uh, Eisenstein's uh, October um, in the context of her um, whole discourse about the museum as a battlefield and about intersections between the museum and uh, political events and revolutions. So um, it also ends up being a new form of montage, as we can see here. Sometimes we see Style herself uh, without any accompanying uh, image on the other screen, uh, but then there is this succession of both moving and still images uh, on the other screen. Uh, uh, Style is uh, gesturing continuously as she is articulating her spoken discourse, which I've um, you know, uh, turned down in this case, so uh, we just focus on the visual component, uh, so sorry about that, Hito. Um, but um, there is here at least, um, um, I would say, uh, 
a first attempt at uh, not just um, using uh, certain uh, tools that are at our disposal pragmatically, but also basically reconfiguring the whole um, text image relation in the context of the new performative imperative. Um, style, of course, is developing uh, notions, is developing arguments, uh, conceptual jump cuts, you might say, in her uh, uh, lecture performances, in her lecture performance videos that she also develops in her written texts, right? So it also filters back into her writing. And there is this, uh, let's say, dialectical interplay between her spoken uh, performance, which you can see very nicely here, and her uh, writing, and uh, there is, in a sense, a same uh, willingness, indeed, to work with jump cuts, both in her uh, um, um, in her writing, in this linear code par excellence, according to Flusser, and in her uh, her speaking, her gesturing, um, in the context of uh, screened uh, images or in relation to screened images. So here we uh, indeed see a very uh, active uh, use of this whole uh, constellation, this whole uh, triangle of media. Um, and perhaps it goes beyond the triangle. Perhaps uh, it is it is a bigger uh, um, a bigger cluster. Um, and um, you might say that uh, as pragmatic as her uh, reasons were for developing this format, um, it certainly. Um, um, allows us, I would say, to um, problematize this proliferation of uh, lecture formats, of lecture video formats, of forms of gesturing that may or not may not be shadow moves. It allows us to problematize this whole culture and to uh, basically uh, make our own kind of montage between uh, style and flusser and to uh, start to uh, come to terms with this um, culture that we find ourselves in. And so uh, what are the uh, more interesting, relevant and productive ways of um, speaking uh, about images, with images? Um, what are the more interesting and productive ways indeed to use the lecture format or various lecture performance formats in relation to writing? If we don't subscribe to Flusser's ultimately very linear narrative, right, about the death of writing and the arrival of a, a post Gutenbergian culture, if we um, um, are convinced that writing actually still has a vital role to play in contemporary intellectual and artistic life, but that its role is obviously very different uh, than it was even 10 years ago. So those are some of the questions that I think uh, a practice like Steyl's in relation to uh, Flusser's um, um, theory of gestures uh, raises for me. Those are some of the questions that I basically want to uh, throw out here that I want to put before you without uh, providing any uh, ready-made um, answers in the hope that indeed this might be the beginning of um, a conversation. And uh, for that, the uh, live meeting in one and the same physical uh, location is still uh, an unparalleled medium and an unparalleled uh, format, I would say. So, thank you. Okay, I stayed within my allotted uh, amount of time, I think, right? I was being a good boy, so we have some time, I guess, for discussion. Hello. I was wondering uh, if he also talked about gestures in terms of the camera, because he talks about right. gestures in terms of writing, but when you hold the camera, right. in how much there's, like how much the writing is associated with the video? I was yeah. 
Yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah, Flusser does address it in, in the tape, right? And it becomes very, in a sense, very silly and very cartoonish because then Fred Forrest starts making, you know, starts just shaking the camera to, to illustrate uh, this basically in, in a rather literal uh, way. Um, but indeed, you're right that this would have to be addressed much more uh, fully and thoroughly, uh, precisely this dialectic uh, of uh, the gesture of speaking and the gesture of, of video or of the camera. And um, there you would then also have to proceed to uh, analyze, um, let's say, various strategies in much more detail. So indeed, with the MOOC, for instance, we have just a fixed camera in front of a, a speaker who addresses you directly. So it's very static in that sense. But it's also yeah, quite intimacy, or there's the suggestion of a certain intimacy. Um, then with the registration of uh, lectures that take place in front of an audience, Sometimes there will be two cameras, sometimes it's just one camera. They try to give you a sense of the whole setup with the audience as well, or they only focus on the speaker, or they pan back and forth between the speaker and things that are being shown on screen. Um, but then, of course, also um, with um, uh, Hito, for instance, there is um, um, ultimately uh, a rather uh, sort of, let's say, conventional and of course, um, medium agree, uh, shot for much of the time, right? So we see her from the waist up. So there is the focus on her, on the upper part of the bo of her body, of her hand gestures, of her her face, obviously. Um, uh, and then sometimes uh, you also get, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a different kind of shot. Um, but that only happens very, uh, very intermittently. Um, and um, here, you know, this is perhaps also what you were getting at. Here, of course, the camera is not being. Uh, foregrounded in a, in a very sort of explicit way, you know, there is no um, Ostraneni here in a sense, right? It 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 does the the image on the left as such is in a sense very naturalizing. Okay, we see the speaker from the waist up, and that's it, right? So uh, this is perhaps also where there could be uh, room for uh, development, also in terms really of um, uh, yeah of the use of the camera. Yeah, um, I'm a bit concerned about Flusser's idea of gesture as mm -hmm. in relation to a space-time continuum. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the way he, in a sense, makes a juxtaposition between gesture and, and writing or written code. Because in a way, we could say that gesture is also something which is, there are gestures for different media or different types of gesture. So, for example, the question of the, the connection between a gesture and a body, for example, and he talks about it in relation to interiority. I was thinking that, mm. for example, gestures travel from yeah. across intervallic space. I mean, we could cite right. an example here from um, Histoire du Cinéma, where Godard analyzes the, the travel, the, the, the voyage of a gesture from Chaplin's the great dictator to Hitler's speeches and how the same gestural language is used and then to a conductor of an orchestra. So you've got this kind of, I think, in, um, you've got this idea that a gesture is something which is somehow independent of the body which yes. carries it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Kundra yeah. wrote, wrote in Immortality something about the voyage of a gesture across several yeah. different bodies as yeah. a meme almost. Exactly. Or you could think of Warburg's pathos formon, right? Yeah. Uh, what are Warburg's pathos formon if not uh, sort of frozen gestures that are transmitted uh, through or across across time and cultures? No, I agree absolutely. But there is there is uh, you know in Flusser on the one hand he can be very sort of almost uh, 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 cartoon like in his reductiveness. Uh, on the other hand, there are all these ambiguities. So uh, when he uh, uh, stresses the fact that actually gestures are codified and that ultimately, um, you know, even though there's the element of interiority, when we analyze the gestures, and this is more fully developed in his book, when we analyze the gestures, we stop caring about interiority. We focus on the gestures. So in a, in a sense, the gestures also kill the interiority and they indeed take on a life of their own, right? And there I think you could connect it to what you're saying about gestures also traveling. Yeah. So I think there are passages that you could latch on to and, and develop in that sense. Yeah. And then Absolutely. there's also the question of writing, because in a sense, writing is also a history of gestures which are, in a sense, inserted into the process of writing. So we could say, for example, Malarmé 
is, yeah. a, is a gesture, or he makes a gesture to create this intervallic space in writing that in a sense is a gesture which traverses the writing but is not really a part of it. I mean, or it, it, it's in a sense, it, it's a kind of gestural shadow component of yeah. the writing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, with writing as well. I mean, obviously writing was hugely important for Flusser, but on the other hand, uh, for something that was so important to him and so central to his life, you know, okay, writing was more important to him than, 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 than life, as he put it, um, he could also be uh, indeed very reductive in his, in his uh, attempts to, let's say, uh, define the platonic essence of, of writing. You know, there is this kind of covert or not so covert uh, idealism in, in Flusser attempts to really um, um, uh, to really arrive at a definition of the very essence of a phenomenon uh, and in that process perhaps all the uh, all the elements that might point into different directions and that might actually lead you to to deconstruct that very uh, that very supposed essence are, are um, sort of uh, given short shrift but what do you think I mean, about the question of, I mean, what you could see of looking at these lecture performance um, forms, that there is, in a sense, a return to the notion that the gesture is something which, um, it acts as this kind of residual trace of the mm. human in a post-human networked right. thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's almost comical, in a yeah. way, yeah. the fact that you yeah, know, there's yeah, this yeah. kind of excessive yeah gesture like Hito Steyrl is like. Exactly. And it's, it's nice exactly. that you show these films without sound because I mean we become aware of that yeah. in a sense. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And I think it would have been even better to, um, to run them uh, simultaneously. But indeed, um, as you say, there is something so comforting in a way, right? About someone being, uh, yeah. someone being human, all too human, and, and then pointing something out physically on the screen and then uncomfortably sort of straddling the divide between the lectern and the screen. Um, in a sense, it almost, um, you know, at, at worst, it can become like sort of, uh, you know, a human zoo, sort of a place where we congregate to reassure ourselves um, about uh, certain um, continuities, right? So um, is it is the whole thing then in a sense? I mean, I would say that there is there is a symptomatic dimension, but I'm also interested in um, uh, trying to um, let's say identify um, specific practices where it goes beyond that, and where there is indeed a kind of uh, a work working with and working through this whole uh, culture of of the um, uh, the lecture performance and the video lecture performance that um, takes it a step further than than mere symptom. Gracias. Sí, voy a hablar en, en castellano. Sven. Gracias. Eh, es una, una pregunta directa, pero con un pequeño comentario. ¿No, no crees que el vídeo de, de Flusser es de alguna manera desactivado por los ejemplos posteriores que has puesto, tanto de, de Ito como de, de Saskia? Porque realmente la academia anglocentrada durante mucho tiempo ha desprestigiado el gesto y el cuerpo mientras menos gestos y menos movimientos y menos emoción hay en el discurso el discurso sería muchísimo más eh, digno de, de ser transmitido en un paper uh, y en pasar por el peer review etcétera etcétera ¿no? con lo cual eh, yo echo de menos el hecho de que las video uh -huh. lectures las uh, video performance eh, no recojan las mejores tradiciones del gesto y no lo digo como uh -huh. mediterránea uh -huh. pero ni como profesora <risa> que me reconozco absolutamente eh, con gestos nada codificados y, y bueno, uh -huh. nosotros normalmente uh -huh. a veces nos, nos comunicamos de, de, de esta forma muchísimo más corporal, ¿no? Con lo cual, el ejemplo de, de estas uh -huh. dos um, personas, no sé si es 
eh, ya como te decía, ¿no? Si, si contradice de alguna manera la frescura mm -hmm. de, de okay. Flusser. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, thank you for that, that question or comment. You know, it wasn't about identifying the best uh, traditions, and I would be interested, perhaps uh, afterwards, in uh, you know discussing that with you and and uh, hearing about some practices that uh, you would consider to uh, exemplify those best traditions. But it was very much about um, addressing a, a phenomenon that has become quite uh, you know universal in a way or quite uh, hegemonic. So even or perhaps especially. Uh, let's say um, you know Anglo-European uh, um, um, academic uh, circles and academicized art circles that perhaps uh, you know historically spring from a culture in which indeed gestures were um, considered to be of minor importance or even considered to be detrimental, um, you know, have been um, incorporated into a new culture, right, in which perhaps indeed uh, there is a certain um, clumsiness or a certain um, inability to uh, really um, address this uh, new uh, situation, uh, which is also, I think, in part what I, uh, yeah, what I wanted to address. So it wasn't about, um, let's say, uh, pointing at uh, the best traditions or the best uh, practices per se, but it was rather about um, raising, um, raising a very pervasive culture uh, as, as an issue or turning it into an issue, turning it into a problem. But then I agree, the second step would be to really look at those, um, those practices that would allow us to uh, basically uh, critique um, critique the the, um, the generic way of doing things right within that framework and I've shown shown you some examples of basically very generic uh, practices and Hito for me is one practice that uh, goes beyond uh, goes beyond the generic in that sense or that at least begins to go beyond the generic uh, but it may well be true that um, uh, many of those uh, more productive examples are not to be uh, found in the north yeah that's entirely possible yo también lo voy a decir en castellano la cosa pensaba que iba a decir ella lo que más me dolía era el ver super impuesto y cuando digo impuesto al cuerpo de Flusser, el subtítulo era como tatuarle en sangre la negación de lo que él pretendía. ¿no? Entonces, era realmente una cárcel tatuada a fuego. ¿no? Entonces, eh, eso por una parte me ha, me ha parecido muy doloroso, porque todos sí. entendíamos sí. su inglés, sí. ¿no? pero hay un sometimiento... Sí. Sí. Eh, absoluto al texto, pero es una lucha que en la historia del teatro siempre se ha dado una lucha mm -hmm. entre en Italia, en un periodo histórico muy yeah. lejano había un momento en el que la gente eh, luchaba entre lo que era el, te el teatro literario y siempre que la palabra ha aparecido en el teatro oh, ha tenido yeah. un conflicto posteriormente al cine ruso como decía Godard, cuando le convencen de que habla mal y, y se convence de que no se puede expresar, pierde toda la capacidad expresiva y se somete al, al texto ¿no? entonces yo creo que el texto es el es el enemigo, o la palabra es el enemigo siempre. ¿no? Y luego, por otra parte, creo que lo más doloroso de los ejemplos posteriores que has puesto de las conferencias es que era la evidencia de la imposibilidad del gesto, precisamente porque se trata de contextos que no son creativos, porque lo, lo interesante de Flusser es que él tenía una voluntad de proponer algo más allá de él como escritor, más allá de él como, como un performer más o menos mediocre, mm -hmm. Había una generosidad y una voluntad eh, ideológica que en todo lo demás es el ejemplo de, de una dictadura de, de, de la explicación y la confesión que ahora mismo se vive en el mundo del arte de manera también dolorosísima. ¿no? Tienes que saber siempre uh -huh. con anticipación qué es lo que vas a hacer porque tienes que saber eh, convencer al otro que vas a justificar lo que vas a hacer. Siempre tienes que confesarte. Y luego, por otra parte, en relación a los medios de comunicación, hay un problema y es que toda la tecnología que estamos utilizando está basada en el miedo al ruido. Eh, todo está diseñado para que no se produzca el ruido. Todo es, es una cultura de lo steady, donde el trípode sería como el, el, el elemento básico, pero la idea de que ahora mismo puedes grabar con un móvil agitándolo y casi no consigues que se produzca una textura, mm. es porque 
vivimos en una sociedad donde el gesto está reprimido en todos los niveles, en la imagen, en el texto y en el cuerpo. Entonces, no sé quién ha dicho el ejemplo del zoo, creo que lo has mencionado tú, cuando hemos visto los últimos ejemplos, ni siquiera en el caso de un artista es capaz de, de, de intentar grabar un detalle de su imagen o grabar un detalle de su nuca, porque está aceptando toda la... Todo, toda una estructura de poder que se da en la iluminación y en el, y en el frame, y en la decisión de, del plano. Entonces, lo que vemos realmente es eh, la jaula del zoo, sería el encuadre, y cualquier movimiento que haga es una reminiscencia de un movimiento, porque no es un movimiento, es decir, un animal encerrado se sabe que necesita seguir moviéndose, pero sabes que no se está desplazando, entonces es muy doloroso, <ríe> es muy doloroso. Mm. Well, yeah, that's also why I mentioned, you know, a human zoo. There is that element, definitely. Um, and uh, with Hito, indeed, there is, in fact, um, there is, in fact, of course, a, of course, a great desire for control. Okay, you know, shown from the waist up, and um, uh, she's very careful also not to, you know, move to the left or right too much. She's also she's always very well uh, framed, and she's gesturing within that. On the other hand, then uh, when you go to, for instance, the Saskia Sassen lecture, there is this element of endearing. Uh, uh, clumsiness, let's say. But okay, um, you know, um, you won't uh, get me to agree with the fact or with your statement that uh, writing is the enemy, but we can discuss that later. I do agree that uh, there is something very strange going on with Baruch Gottlieb's subtitles for the Flusser video, because for one thing also, they're actually riddled with little glitches and mistakes. There's mis mis misheard words, etc. So once you start to focus on that, there is actually also a process of uh, mistranslation and and a mismatch between the oral and uh, and the written. Uh, I suppose it's it's intended as a kind of pragmatic service to people, you know, who in a noisy exhibition with other videos may not be able to otherwise uh, follow the discourse. Also, given his accent, but uh, it's a very odd uh, glitched um, 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 text. Actually, the, the subtitles. Mm -hmm. Words. Words, okay. Ah, sorry. Perdona, no soy micrófono. Uh, no, que lo, si he dicho que writing is the enemy, que me refería más a que siempre que las palabras aparecen hay que tener un especial cuidado, porque cuando estamos haciendo una película estamos escribiendo, digamos, ¿no? Cuando estamos hablando podemos estar escribiendo, pero siempre que han aparecido las palabras en en nuestra cultura, vamos a decir, en varias culturas, no, uh, no sé, siempre aparece un elemento represor, bueno, yeah. humano, yeah. no sé. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and of course, for Flusser, actually, there was also a strong continuity between, let's say, the age of writing and the age of print and uh, uh, the new age of coded services, techno codes, and all those terms that he uses, because basically for him, you know, it's not a return to a pre-literary a pre, uh, 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 a pre -literary or a pre-linguistic age. It is actually continuing the culture of writing as codification in, uh, in new ways, right, in the, in the form of digital codes and what have you. So in a sense, it's, it's a triumph of writing and a triumph of codification, which again raises the question indeed of what is being repressed or what happens to uh, those elements that resist uh, um, codification. Yo quería apuntar una cosa con respecto a la que he dicho al anterior. Eh la anterior a ver, la misma persona y es que bueno se ha hablado de eh, en un momento de la conferencia se ha hablado de Rudolf von Laban y sobre el pensamiento coreográfico y cómo este se hace cargo del movimiento y claro eh, cuando pienso de que, que las palabras se hacen cargo de los gestos veo una, una, un disenso entre ambos lenguajes puesto que si nos hacemos cargo de los gestos eh, de la vida cotidiana estos eh, al fin y al cabo expresan una continuidad y el lenguaje per se no puede hacerse cargo de cosas continuas sino que necesita un principio y un final para, para hablar de ello de forma concreta y eso es lo que hace de alguna manera la coreografía ¿no? eh, eh, estructura el movimiento y lo, y lo parcela para poder hablar de él si no, no podría hablar de él ¿no? yo me acuerdo que tuve un, un taller con Boris Sarmatz y él nos hablaba y él nos decía, bueno, vamos a empezar eh, haciendo gestos 
eh, vamos, a, vamos a hablar de 100 gestos, cada uno va a hacer 100 gestos. La, cuestión, la pregunta que nos surgía de primero era, bueno, ¿y dónde empieza y dónde acaba otro, un gesto? ¿no? Entonces, claro, para hablar de los 100 gestos eh, tenemos que definir eh, cada gesto, ¿no? dónde empieza uno y otro. Entonces, el, yo creo que de alguna manera... Eh, hablar de, un, de gestualidad o hablar de cada gesto es algo como un imposible, ontológicamente imposible, ¿no? Por eso, pero, pero pienso en la coreografía, la coreografía es un, es un impuesto, es, es una impostura filosófica a, a partir de, para hablar sobre la gestualidad. Pero desde la creación barroca de la orqueosografía, yo creo que es algo que se critica ¿no? a partir del, del, de, de, la, de la danza de los años 60 y 70 ¿no? de, o de Fluxus también. No sé, es algo mm. al aire. ¿eh? Mm. Mm. <risa> yeah, well, thank you. I don't know if I have to respond directly. You know, you made, you made some good comments, but indeed. Uh, um, Without a question per se, so yeah. eh, just, eh, en castellano. <laughs> no, es uno, una pregunta muy simple. Me preguntaba por cuál era el contexto de, de visionado de, de los vídeos de Flusser, ¿no? Como, eh, me imagino que serían contextos pedagógicos, pero cómo se distribuían, cómo, cómo se visionaba, ¿no? Porque habla muy directamente como a un solo individuo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, not a specific person, but a, but a hypothetical uh, future viewers, even a future viewer or a group, um, even though he was thinking in terms of several uh, months. So um, that's something that I would also like to um, um, sort of investigate further and raise with, uh, with Fred uh, Forrest. Um, to what extent this was indeed shown at certain festivals or to what extent it was distributed within this network of... Uh, video institutions that you that you had by the mid um, by the mid uh, 70s. Um, I don't suppose that this uh, sort of scenario that he sketches of people then also critiquing and adding to or re-editing the tape was ever uh, put into uh, play. I don't think that was ever uh, acted upon. Um, now there is sort of the new edit, or there's a couple of different new edits. So it's been adapted. You know, in addition to the subtitles, it's been adapted to widescreen with a, you know these small inserts on the right to make it fit the contemporary uh, widescreen format which then also um, sort of creates a, um, a different form of montage but yeah concerning the historical uh, uses if any of uh, of the tape in the mid 70s that's something that i would like to um, uh, discuss with fred forrest and um, uh, look into for um, you know uh, possibly possibly a written article at some point uh, in a you know which would be perverse of course but i'm not uh, i'm not averse to that um, and uh, let's see there was one more point that i wanted to make yeah so i don't you know i don't think it ever really took off for flusser in that ultimately also when he was basically almost wrapping up his life's work around 1990-91 when he published this whole series of books in German um, and the gesture book is one of them you know he did return to his uh, sort of privileged uh, medium uh, and his privileged mode of thinking par excellence you know and I think by the by the 1980s or even by the late 70s I think this sort of foray into video had uh, largely been uh, forgotten and of course he continued to collaborate with artists such as Louis Beck but I don't think much ever came of this uh, foray into uh, into video Que ahora vamos a hacer un pequeño break, ¿no? ¿De sí, cuánto? ¿no? Hasta, ahí, hasta 35. Hasta 10 minutos. Uh -huh. bueno. Muchas gracias.